introduce our speaker, Dr. George Horn, who is board certified in critical care medicine, internal medicine, and pulmonary disease. He specializes in the evaluation and diagnosis of pulmonary nodules and masses. As an educator, Dr. Horn has was honored with the Teacher of the Year Award for CPMC's Internal Medicine Residency Program, along with an American Thoracic Society Fellows Career Development Award. Uh, joining us later is also a certified emergency nurse, Nurse Deb Bishop, who is going to be sharing the information on the low-dose CT scan. Hey, great. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, Glenn. Um, my name is uh, George Horn. I'm a pulmonary critical care physician. I practice at California Pacific uh, Medical Center uh, in the ICU. Um, and then I also have a uh, practice uh, called San Francisco Lung and Sleep Clinic that's just right across the street from the Van Ness Hospital. And I'm here to talk about the general overview of lung cancer. And we definitely will get to screen during this uh, talk as well. So uh, just um, a quick overview, I have no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest related to this talk. And really these are the questions and the areas that I want to cover today. Uh, just a real basic, what is lung cancer? Uh, we'll also talk about what the symptoms are. Um, and I'll go into an overview of the diagnosis, staging, treatment, and then we'll get to screening and um, navigating the system, which can be challenging and, and as well as future directions. I wanna emphasize that this is an overview. I want people to have a framework of how to approach and think about lung cancers, lung nodules after this talk. And just understand that there's always nuances and uh, personalization for every patient. And so this is um, really to get us going, speaking a common language, but certainly by no means is it the, um, the, the sort of final say in this topic. So uh, just starting off um, with the simple, what is lung cancer? And to keep it really simple, it's cancer that comes in the lung. Uh, it can come from any part of the lung and there are various types of lung cancers, which we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, but any uh, cancer that uh, begins from the lung is what we consider to be lung cancer. Turns out that lung cancer is the second most common cancer behind breast cancer and prostate cancer, but it is the most lethal of all the cancers, and it accounts for approximately 25% of all cancer deaths. The main risk factor for lung cancer is smoking, cigarette smoking. Um, there certainly are occupational exposures, and uh, if you see one of the pulmonologists, we'll always be asking about certain exposures to asbestos, heavy metals, diesel exhaust fumes. Um, a lot of secondhand smoke exposure has been uh, attributed to increased risk of lung cancer as well. And then uh, radon um, gas uh, definitely uh, is well known to increase the risk of lung cancer. Other risks that uh, we'll, we'll ask about but are not as strong as smoking or radon, uh, prior history of lung cancer. So if you've had a lung cancer already and maybe it was treated, maybe it was resected, you are at an increased risk of developing new lung cancer. If you've had history of radiation therapy that uh, maybe it wasn't for the lungs, but maybe part of the lungs uh, was involved, uh, that increases your risk of developing lung cancer in the future. And then we're learning more and more about family history. And so if you have family members who are diagnosed at a younger age, uh, there may be um, some family history component to it, but this is still an area of discovery and something that is not well worked out. There is a registry going on, there's more study going on, trying to tease out family history for lung cancer but it's not as strong of a link as we found for many of the other cancers such as breast, ovarian, uh, colon, et cetera. Uh, we talked a little bit about secondhand smoke exposure. Uh, and so uh, for patients who are not smokers themselves, but are exposed to a lot of secondhand smoke, especially at a younger age, uh, there certainly can be an increase in risk of lung cancer. And then more and more, we're appreciating that air pollution um, can contribute and cause lung cancer. These are more of epidemiological studies. So countries who have increased air pollution, increased particulate matter, have an increased uh, incidence of lung cancer. But um, the exact link is a little bit less well worked out than say a cigarette smoking. Um, and this is actually the most recent data taken from the CDC. And I just wanted to show you a uh, top 10 cancer rates uh, so these are new cancer cases in the U.S. in 2019, 
And you can see, so I told you lung cancer was the second leading cause of cancer. And it's true because for females, it's breast cancer and then lung cancer. And for males, it's prostate cancer and then lung cancer. And so it really is um, the second leading cause of cancer in the US. And that's held true for many years. And then in terms of cancer death rates, we can see here lung and bronchus by far exceeds any of the other cancers uh, by a pretty significant margin. And uh, this is, uh, again, 2019, sort of the most recent data that we have in the office CDC. So what are the symptoms of lung cancer? Many times they can include a chronic cough, hemoptysis, or coughing of blood. Some patients notice a change in the voice. Some get chest pain. Some get pneumonias over and over again. Uh, but many patients with lung cancer actually have no symptoms, and that is uh, what has made lung cancer very challenging to diagnose and, uh, and to treat over time, is that many patients, by the time they develop some sort of symptom, seek help um, and get a workup, um, their lung cancer uh, tends to be relatively advanced stage, and we'll talk about staging a little bit so you understand that. And uh, when the cancer is at advanced stage, our treatment options are uh, much less effective. And so uh, diagnosis, um, typically start off with some sort of chest imaging study. So whether it's a chest x-ray, a CT scan of the chest, or a PET CT, and now we're doing CT scans more and more for other reasons. So if you have, say, abdominal pain, many times uh, you may get a CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pel uh, of the abdomen and pelvis, so of the stomach area and lower. But the CT starts off and captures the lower part of the lung, and sometimes some abnormality is detected that way. Uh, there's more and more use of CTs in the evaluation of heart disease. And so there are now CT scans of the heart to look at the uh, coronary arteries and determine the calcium score. Well, sometimes part of the lung is captured on those CTs, and we can see some abnormality that then leads to further workup. And so uh, the lung cancer evaluation starts off with some sort of imaging abnormality. Uh, and typically that is a pulmonary nodule, or, um, but it doesn't always have to be a pulmonary nodule. But there's usually some sort of imaging abnormality um, of, of a scan of the lung. Um, and certainly if we have uh, something that we find, many times we may do an additional more detailed study to really visualize and better characterize what that abnormality is. Uh, and so, for example, sometimes we'll see something that looks abnormal on a chest x-ray, and uh, that may then be followed up by a CT scan or even a PET CT. Uh, things can suggest on imaging, meaning we can see something and say, well, this really looks like cancer, this really looks more like an infection, et cetera. But the only way to make a diagnosis or the only way to really confirm that some abnormality that we see on imaging is cancer is we need to biopsy it. We need to take some cells from that abnormal area uh, and look at the cells under a microscope. And so there's a lot of things that may suggest cancer or is suspicious for cancer, but the biopsy is the way to diagnose and to treat cancer. And really what we want to do, the general principle is you want to have the least invasive method to biopsy a sample. And so there's a whole a gradation of invasiveness that we think about as clinicians where um, we try and use the, the easiest approach, the least invasive approach. And if we really cannot make the diagnosis, then we might move on to the next step, which is a little bit more invasive, et cetera. Uh, and, and so, uh, with that in mind, the approaches that we use are either with video bronchoscopy, and underneath that, there's a subsets or specialization of navigational bronchoscopy and endobronchial ultrasound. Uh, you can also have a CT guided approach um, where you use a CT scan to guide your needle for biopsy. And ultimately, if it's an area that you really can't get to with some of these less invasive techniques, there are some patients that need to undergo long surgery to get to a certain part of the lung. And so just a uh, quick um, overview of video bronchoscopy for those of you 
uh, who are unfamiliar. So a bronchoscopy, a bronchoscope is basically a camera uh, at the end of a thin flexible tube. There's a light source there. And we actually take this thin flexible camera, go through the mouth or nose sometimes and go into your lungs. We go and follow your airways, go into your trachea, and we can go into the large airways, the right, left, main stem, et cetera. Um, there's a channel within the tube. And so if we uh, see something abnormal, we can pass tools next to that channel, needles, forceps, et cetera, take some biopsies to take themselves. So video bronchoscopy, uh, very helpful for um, evaluating how your airways look, your breathing tubes look uh, from the inside. And if you have any abnormalities, any tumors uh, that actually are close to the center of your chest, the center of your breathing tubes, and we can see it, we can do a direct biopsy with that. Uh, a video bronchoscopy is also very helpful in evaluating for infection uh, for pneumonia because we can actually put some salt water in through the camera. A uh, working channel, uh, rinse out whatever part of the lung that we're interested in, take some of that salt water out and see what grows out of there. An advancement in video bronchoscopy is endobronchial ultrasound. And that's basically that same bronchoscope, that same camera, but this one has been modified so that it has an ultrasound probe at the very tip. And uh, what that allows us to do is for lymph nodes, which usually are found adjacent to your airways, adjacent to the breathing tubes, we can actually see those lymph nodes, even though they are outside, um, oops. even though they are, are outside the airway, we can use the ultrasound to, 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 to visualize those lymph nodes, and then we can put a needle uh, into those lymph nodes very precisely. Um, avoiding blood vessels and other critical structures to take samples. And this becomes really important um, in lung nodule and lung cancer evaluation because the staging often depends on whether the lymph nodes are involved. And so with this endobronchial ultrasound, we really are able to access the majority of the lymph nodes uh, in the lung and provide accurate staging. And then finally, a further advancement in bronchoscopy is called navigational bronchoscopy. And here, we really create a virtual airway with the CT scan um, and process it into something that um, allows us to then navigate a bronchoscope or a thin catheter to much deeper parts of your lung with precision. So these are parts of the lung that they're so far in, the airways are so small, we can't see anything with our video bronchoscope anymore. They're too narrow, so we can't push our normal bronchoscope any further. But now we have special navigation techniques to go even further into the lung and to be able to precisely navigate um, to a tumor or an abnormality that's deep in the lung that we can't see, but that we can get to and then put our tools in there to do biopsies to take samples. So bronchoscopy uh, is very helpful for uh, nodules, tumors, or abnormalities closer to the center of the chest. Uh, and certainly any evaluation of lymph nodes with the addition of the endobronchial ultrasound um, makes that very uh, easy and accessible. And then finally, we can get out to deeper parts of the lung with a navigational bronchoscopy. And so we're covering um, a significant portion of the lung with, uh, with these procedures or techniques. But if you have something that's at the real edge of the lung, it might be easier to go from the outside in. And that's where a CT guided approach comes in. So under a CT scan, you can guide a needle into your nodule or mass. And here is an example of a CT guided approach to something in the lung. This, uh, this mass actually is relatively close to the edge of the lung. And so it's a little bit easier to go from outside in than to go from inside out. And so that's what I mean by uh, we want to use the least invasive approach for a biopsy. It depends on where the lesion is and what can we get to uh, the easiest. Is it closer to the center of your lung or is it near an airway where we know our bronchoscope can be and therefore a bronchoscopy, whether regular video, navigation, EBUS, 
uh, is going to be the easiest approach to get some tissue, or is it near the edge of the lung where we should go from the outside in, uh, use a CT guided approach to guide a needle to that area. In very rare instances now, because our technology has advanced, um, but there are rare instances where something is so close to a critical structure or sort of in between what we can get to with bronchoscopy um, and with the CT guidance that uh, surgery might be needed. And so this is really surgery to um, where, where cameras are placed uh, in between the ribs and to the chest um, to get to the all aspects of the lung. Uh, for biopsy, that's becoming much less and less common. So um, that's really the different approaches to get samples of cells to look at under a microscope. Um, and, and really for the diagnosis, uh, you need to look at the cells under a microscope. And there are certain stains that will tell us, okay, this cell came from the lung or didn't come from the lung. It looks abnormal and it's this type of cancer. Um, and so uh, it's so important um, to know um, the type of cancer, lung cancer that you have, because the treatments are, are very different. And so to keep it really simple, there's really two main types of lung cancer. There is something called small cell lung cancer and non-small cell lung cancer. So that's really the basic uh, distinction. And small cells, they look like smaller than normal cells that, and these are cancer cells that look actually smaller than normal um, and they behave differently uh, than the other type which are cancer cells that look larger <laughs> than the small cell um, and they may be uh, similar in size to normal cells or they may be larger than normal cells but they're because they're not small cell they're considered non-small cell now within non-small cell lung cancer there are certain additional categories as well uh, where we can maybe say there's squamous cell or adenocarcinoma, there's even um, large cell in there. But uh, the important distinction to make up front is, are we dealing with a small cell lung cancer or a non-small cell lung cancer? Small cell accounts for 15% of lung cancers uh, and non-small cell accounts for 85% of lung cancers. So once you figure out what kind of cancer you have, are we talking about small cell or non-small cell, then we really need to uh, determine what stage the cancer is. The treatments and the outcomes are very different. And so if you have early stage, and if you wanna put a number to it, you'll hear stage one or two, that's considered early stage. Basically the cancer is really in one area of the lung and it really has not gone to other parts of the lung. And so it's possible for surgery or an equivalent to surgery to completely remove the tumor, get rid of all the cancer cells out of the body and uh, plan for a cure uh, to, really, to really cure someone of the cancer. Once the lung cancer cells have spread beyond just that one part of the lung, let's say they go to the lymph nodes in the middle of the chest called the mediastinum, or even they go to the other side of the lung, or they go outside of the lung, we're at advanced stage. And so this would be stage three and stage four. And in general, um, our understanding of this is that the cancer is too widespread because it's not just in that one part of the lung. Even if you did surgery, cut out that one part of the lung, you have cancer cells elsewhere that are just going to grow and your cancer is going to come back. And so surgery really is not an option. And our therapies are meant to slow down the growth, uh, maybe control the cancer cell over time, but rarely do we completely eradicate or eliminate every single cancer cell in the body. And the reason, uh, and so here's a, an example of just the staging. So if you look at stage one, the tumor is just in that one part of the lung. Stage two is that the tumor is in that one part of the lung. And then the lymph node near that tumor is also positive, but it's still within that general area of the lung. So that would be stage one and stage two. And uh, we have a chance to cut all the cancer cells out with surgery or to destroy all the cancer cells with radiation therapy and actually cure somewhat of the cancer. Once it gets to stage three cancer where it's spread to the lymph nodes in the middle of the chest, the mediastinum, 
or to stage four where it's spread to other parts of the lung or other parts of the body, this is the advanced stage and cutting the cancer out, cutting the tumor out really isn't going to um, get rid of the cancer cells that have gone elsewhere. And so the treatments are really uh, meant to control the growth, um, to um, prevent the spread maybe, uh, but uh, most likely unable to get rid of every single cancer cell in the body. And so the reason why this is important is because the survival is very different. And so this is the five-year survival, and this is data from 2015 to 2019, which is the most recent. And uh, in this database, which is called the SEER database, uh, instead of using stage one, two, they use local, regional, and distant. Um, and so if you look at localized, which would be your stage one um, lung cancer, uh, maybe some early stage two, you're seeing a 57% five-year survival. And the five-year survival is a rule of thumb to say, if you've lived for five years, then you're cured of your cancer. That's sort of the, the benchmark for saying someone is cured. So we're talking about 57% in early stage, where at five years, you're alive. Um, if you're a little bit more advanced stage, so stage two, um, you're really and some early stage here, you're really at 31.8% or 32%. So definitely a decrease from the early stage. And then once the cancer has spread, look at that, it's down to 7.2% at five years. So pretty dismal. And then uh, for patients who they're not quite sure about staging, they lump them all together. And so who knows what stage they were, but if we can't stage someone, that's also not a good sign, but only at 15% five years to five. And this is all types of cancers. This is uh, both uh, small cell and non-small cell. If you break up into non-small cell lung cancer, so this is the five five year survival uh, at localized, we're sixty four percent regional, thirty seven distant, eight um, percent, with an overall survival. Everything combined for non-small cell at five years of a twenty two percent survival. Whereas here, look at uh, small cell; it's terrible. Even if you're localized. For small cell, you're only at 29% uh, five year survival. And then if you have uh, regional or distant disease, 18%, 2%, and all comers for small cell is 7% at five years. And so uh, the treatment certainly uh, has to be individualized for the patient, both on type of cancer, stage. Uh, as well as we'll talk about a little bit later, what uh, markers your cancer cells may have, uh, and also what treatments uh, may be best for you, uh, what you can tolerate um, and what you cannot tolerate. And so these are, this is a framework that I'm establishing here, but by no means do I want you to take this and say, oh, you know, I went to this talk and they said I should get this for this stage of cancer. Not at all. Uh, it needs to have a discussion with the physician, but this is how you can start to understand um how the physicians are thinking and so uh for early stage lung cancer and i mentioned this a lot because it's really important it's our chance to have the best outcome if we can find cancer at an early stage we can use surgery to completely remove the cancer just cut it out or if someone is unable to tolerate surgery or doesn't want surgery there is an alternative called stereotactic body radiation or stereotactic radiation therapy, which uh, basically is meant to be a substitute for surgery. It's meant to um, use a high enough radiation dose at the tumor, at the cancer, to uh, kill those cancer cells. And uh, when we are using surgery or stereotactic radiation therapy, we're really trying to get rid of all the cancer cells in that area to cure a patient of disease. We're, we're shooting for it. Here, we're going through it here. You're at an advanced stage, stage three, stage four, cancer spread outside that area. Surgery is not going to help. It's going to help in that one area, but you have cancer cells elsewhere that are just going to grow. And so really, we're talking about treatments to slow down the growth. So there's chemotherapy, which can slow down the growth of cancer cells. You can also use radiation therapy. So it's not that high dose in the concentrated area, but a lower dose over a wider area to slow in this the growth or destroy cancer cells in, in the radiation field. 
And then what's been exciting in the past 10 years is there's really been a tremendous advancement of specific targeted therapies, and we'll get into that a little bit, and now immunotherapy as well to really uh, help uh, control the growth um, and, and sometimes uh, even uh, control over an extended period of time uh, the cancer and prevent it from coming back. So surgery. Um, really, no one uses the open approach anymore where you have to crack ribs and open up um, the chest uh, with a big incision. Uh, really, nowadays, it's done through a video-assisted approach, so video-assisted fluoroscopic surgery, uh, in which you have a camera that you can uh, place between the ribs uh, to get into the space outside the lung, and then with separate incisions between the ribs, you can put instruments in there. And so with the camera and the instruments, you are able to access all parts of the lung and also uh, to um, cut out the parts that you need to. So really a video-assisted fluoroscopic approach is, is the way to go these days, and, and that's what's done uh, in the majority of institutions. Uh, and so, yes, surgery, if you can cut out the cancer, chance to, to get rid of all the cancer cells. Uh, if surgery is not an option for whatever reason, but it's still early stage and we still want to kill all the cancer cells, this is the stereotactic body radiation therapy. Um, there's different brand names for it. So have you ever heard of the brand name CyberKnife? That's a company that marketed it. It sounds pretty neat, um, but that would be a brand name of something that does this. Uh, there's other brand names out there. But basically, the concept is that you have uh, multiple lower dose radiation beams that all cross at the center where your tumor is, where your cancer is. And so where the cancer is, all those low dose beams combine together to have a really high radiation dose, high enough to kill those cells. But because you're using low dose for it to get through to that area, you have less side effects uh, for the skin, the other parts of the lung, the tissue, et cetera. And uh, this is meant to be a substitute for surgery. So the goal for this is to kill off all the cancer cells in that area and to, uh, to go for a cure as well. So if, if those two approaches are not an option because the cancer has spread uh, too, too much, uh, then um, really the traditional approach has been chemotherapy. And chemotherapy certainly used for lots of cancers in general. And the concept is that uh, you give some sort of toxic medication that targets fast growing cells. And because cancer cells grow faster than normal cells, cancer cells are more affected than normal cells, but there are other fast growing cells in your body, your hair, bone marrow, et cetera. And so they are also affected and that's where the side effects that you hear about for chemotherapy come from. So it's using growth of cells as a differentiator, um, but nothing really specific for the cancer other than the cancer cells are growing faster. A lot of times with chemotherapy, you can combine it with radiation therapy. So this isn't that stereotactic radiation where we get a really high dose to kill the cells, but this would be a wider area, lower dose radiation, uh, and it's meant to slow down the growth or kill cancer cells. And radiation does that by damaging the DNA. And so the DNA gets too damaged and the cells die. Uh, it can be used in conjunction with chemotherapy, and there's actually some chemotherapy drugs that can actually make the cancer cells more sensitive to radiation damage and therefore um, combine chemotherapy and radiation that improves the overall effect uh, of either one of them. And so that has been uh, the traditional treatment approach uh, for lung cancer, and it still may be the best approach for certain patients. But I mentioned uh, probably the last 10 to 15 years, uh, we've we've understood more and more about lung cancer biology. And what we found is that many cancers have different types of mutations that's driving the growth. And um, different cancers uh, can have different mutations. So the same uh, non-small cell lung cancer in two different patients can have two different mutations. And the reason why these mutations or these abnormalities are so important is that they can predict response to different types of now targeted drugs that target the effects of those mutations. And I showed the slide not to 
really go over every single uh, mutation or, or abnormality, but to show you that this field has really exploded, that we have now many, many drugs targeting different aspects of the lung cancer biology. Um, and now, each of these abnormalities may only affect 20%, 10%, 7% of patients. Uh, but if you're in that 7%, getting one of these targeted drugs can have very significant benefits um, effects, uh, in controlling your cancer. And so nowadays, for patients who have advanced stage lung cancer, really, in addition to getting uh, cells, to getting the uh, biopsy to, to make a diagnosis of lung cancer, say, yeah, this really is cancer. Um, we are sending the samples off for a screen uh, to see which mutations may be present. And if a mutation is detected, then instead of chemotherapy and radiation therapy, uh, may move to one of these medications uh, first to uh, see if there's a better effect. Uh, because these medications are specific for that cancer, for that mutation, their side effect profile in general is much less than chemotherapy um, and radiation therapy. Uh, as we speak, there's more and more uh, medications in the pipeline every year. There's a few uh, more newer medications that come out targeting um, uh, different aspects of, uh, of mutations or, or of abnormalities in, in the cancer cells. So this is a really exciting piece. And then there's also immunotherapy. And this is actually a really expanding field. And it's actually probably more advanced than some of the other cancers like melanoma. But the general principle is that your immune system actually is supposed to detect abnormalities in your body and to fight them. And many cancer cells have come up with mechanisms to evade your immune system from recognizing, from detecting them. Um, and, uh, and therefore, hide from your immune system. Immunotherapy, and depends on what aspect of the immune system, and, and a lot of them work on T cells, but there's certainly uh, more that are being worked on. It really uh, helps your immune system. It unmasks the cancer, basically, so your immune system starts to recognize the cancer cells as something that is abnormal, and that's something that your immune system can then uh, be used uh, to uh, fight the cancer. And so just, um, I had briefly mentioned this earlier, but really advanced diagnostics are uh, coming into the forefront. Uh, we're starting to, in general, for advanced stage cancers, and sometimes even for earlier stage cancers too, uh, we're testing the cancer cells for certain mutations, see what targeted therapies uh, may be, uh, what, what mutations may be present, and therefore what targeted therapies may be the most beneficial. Uh, we're also looking for expression of certain immune receptors to see if patients are candidates for uh, immunotherapy. Uh, what's pretty neat is that we can also now check your blood for circulating tumor cells in advanced stage cancer. Some of the tumors escape into the bloodstream, and the technology is so sensitive now we can pick up those tumor cells and test for mutations in there. So if you ever heard of the term liquid biopsy, that's what's uh, being referred to. Um, the blood for circulating tumor cells right now is only good enough to test for mutations if you know someone has a cancer, but it's not good enough to diagnose a cancer. So if you have an abnormality uh, and you're not sure what it is, you still need a biopsy to take a look at the, the cells underneath the microscope first to make a diagnosis. But then once you have a diagnosis, sometimes checking for uh, circulating tumor cells in your blood and for mutations uh, can be helpful in and determine what treatments you may benefit from. So moving on to the next topic. So we, we covered a lot there. We talked about what lung cancer is, how to diagnose it, what the general treatment options are. Um, but um, really what's exciting in the field in probably the last eight years or so is that uh, we now have an approach, a technique to catch lung cancer early, to catch it in that early stage so that we can have better therapies and actually um, uh, make a dent in the overall mortality. So we now have evidence that lung cancer screening works. And 
they've been trying, Faye meaning the medical field, you know, I guess we, I should say, we've been trying for a long time to find a good screening uh, test for lung cancer in the 70s and 80s, looked at lung cancer screening with chest x-rays, uh, checking sputums on a regular basis to see if you could find cancer cells, and none of them hand out, actually, nothing worked um, to detect cancer uh, earlier. And finally, uh, more recently, um, uh, there was a study, which I'll go into, which showed that if you were to get a low-dose CT scan every year for a select population of patients that are at higher risk of lung cancer, you can pick up cancer earlier, and you can intervene earlier. And then the patients that got the CT scan every year, that general population actually lived longer. They, they had a mortality benefit, which is very exciting. And this isn't the regular CT scan that we usually use if someone has a cough and we want to figure out why. This is a special lower dose CT scan because if you're getting a CT scan every year, you start to become aware of the radiation doses that you're getting with the CT scans. And so this specialized CT scan is about four to five times less than that of a standard CT scan. So this was the main study that showed that lung cancer screening worked. It's called the National Lung Screening Trial. It was published in uh, 2011, so now over a decade. And it was pretty impressive. They studied over 50,000 patients who were at high risk for lung cancer across 33 US medical centers. And it took them a long time. It was 2002 to 2009 that the study ran for. And what they did was they defined patients at high risk for lung cancer as those who are age 55 to 74, and they use cigarette smoking as the risk factor. So either patients were actively smoking or if they quit, not they, they had to quit less than 15 years ago, and they had to smoke a, a fair bit. Uh, they had to smoke more than 30 pack year history. And the way that we calculate pack year history is we take the average packs per day times the number of years smoked. And so we're talking about patients who have smoked on average, a pack of days for 30 years or more. Uh, those were the patients who were deemed to be at much higher risk of lung cancer. And they basically split those patients into two. It was randomized. Uh, and so half of them got a low dose CT scan at baseline. Um, and then every year, um, and then the other half got chest x rays. And they had certain protocols that they followed if they found an abnormality of what. Um, so they did that for two years, and then they followed the patients out for longer. And what they found was that those who got the lung cancer screening CT, they actually decreased the rate of death from lung cancer by 20%. Uh, and while they were getting these lung cancer CT scans, they would pick up other things. So there might have been an aneurysm in the aorta that they picked up or some other problem that um, that was unknown. And so the overall death from any cause was decreased by 6.7%. Uh, but, and there is always a but, um, the, the CT scan is so good at picking up things that a lot of patients have abnormality. 24% of patients who had the screening CT, they had some sort of abnormality that needed to be um, looked at further. And so the majority of abnormalities, all they did was repeated the CT scan. And so that was 58%. 6% actually went for a needle biopsy and 5% went for surgery. So of that 24% who had some abnormality on the CT scan, only three or 4% actually had lung cancer, which if you take a look at the total population meant that 96% of the abnormalities were due to something else. And so it was not uncommon to have some abnormality on your CT and actually, most of them didn't have lung cancer it was due to something else. But for those three to four percent that actually had lung cancer, they were able to capture the lung cancer earlier, intervene earlier, and those patients lived longer. And it was such a significant effect that it pulled up the entire population so that all the patients who had screening uh, were able to uh, to live longer. Um, and this, this these results have actually been replicated now. There's a big European trial that was published in 2019 called the Nelson trial. It was about 13,000 patients. And they had similar criteria, not exactly the same, but they were able to show a benefit to lung cancer screening as well. And so really lung cancer screening has come to the forefront in allowing us 
on the high risk individual, the high risk population to offer something that is effective in capturing lung cancer at an earlier stage, allowing for us to intervene at an earlier stage and therefore improve the overall outcome uh, of patients who undergo screening. So lung cancer screening definitely works, but remember, 24% had some abnormality, only three or 4% had lung cancer. A lot of them had an abnormality that wasn't lung cancer. And so you really need to get your lung cancer screening done at a center that has expertise, that knows how to evaluate nodules, knows how to differentiate between, okay, that looks like cancer. We really need to go after it now versus, you know, that doesn't look like cancer. Um, there may be other reasons. I think we can do another evaluation or we can repeat imaging in a set period of time to follow up. Uh, because of the newer data uh, that came out from Europe, uh, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force um, now has uh, the newest recommendations are to recommend screening for lung cancer with a yearly low-dose CT scan for those who are ages 50 to 80 for active smokers or quit within the past 15 years. And now they've even gone down a little bit more. You need a 20 pack year history. So a pack a day for 20 years on average. If you meet those uh, qualifications of that criteria, then you uh, are recommended to get a yearly low dose CT scan uh, to look for lung cancer. And uh, because it is now an official recommendation by the US Preventative Services Task Force, it is something that Medicare follows and therefore insurance follows as well. All right, so that was um, a lot of negativity, I guess. I mean, the screening isn't so negative, but a lot of the mortality data I showed and outcomes are pretty, pretty sobering. But I do want to let people know that there is hope in the air. And so this is actually the national trends in cancer death rates. And this is data from the CDC, and I believe this is the most recent, actually. I don't have the date on there, but this is 2019 or 2020, whatever. Oh, there it is, 2014 to 2018. And what I want you to look at where I have the arrow is, um, of all the cancers, lung cancer has overall had the biggest decrease in death rate over this period of time. Only melanoma which is a much rarer cancer, has a bigger decrease in the death rate. So lung cancer overall, uh, since 2014, has decreased uh, by 5.2% overall in their death rate. And we think, we, we, think uh, we, we have pretty strong data to suggest that partly due to lung cancer screening with earlier detection and an ability to have better outcomes in the screen patients, but also better treatments. A lot of those targeted therapies that I mentioned, uh, the immunotherapy, they really have um, been more effective in controlling cancer for many patients uh, who are eligible and have really made a difference in improving the overall survival uh, of lung cancer. And, and so those therapies, they are coming down the pipeline several every year. And so this is an exciting time uh, within the lung cancer field because we are starting to really see a real impact in the new treatments as well as the lung cancer screening. I think we're probably going to see even more impacts in the lung cancer screening because lung cancer screening really did not become an official recommendation until 2015 or so, somewhere around there. And after things are recommended, it still takes a while for it to gain traction. So I don't I don't feel that we've actually even seen the full benefits of lung cancer screening. And yet here we are already, the second biggest decrease in lung cancer and cancer deaths overall compared to all the other cancers. So uh, to me, that's a, a positive sign. So uh, moving on to navigating the system, I think uh, I'm going to be finished on soon and we'll have time for questions. But absolutely, this can be a confusing, frustrating, and scary process. And so I'm a pulmonary physician, so I'm going to plug uh, what I do, and I, I really feel that a pulmonary physician is best suited to be the person evaluating the lung nodule. And when I use the term lung nodule, basically, it's the abnormality that's seen on the chest imaging, whether it's a chest x-ray, CT scan, 
whatever imaging study you have. Right? And the reason why is the majority of lung nodules are actually not due to cancer. And as a pulmonary physician, we're always looking at abnormalities in the lung. We're always evaluating abnormalities in the lung and trying to figure out, well, what is it? Is it an infection? What kind of infection is it? Is it cancer? How do we get to it, et cetera? And so um, really from a diagnostic perspective, before you know what that abnormality is, you want um, the pulmonary physician to be driving the diagnosis. And, um, and at CPMC, we have something called a diagnostic thoracic tumor board. And what that means is even before a cancer is diagnosed, we just have someone with an abnormal finding on CT scan. They have a pulmonary nodule, let's say. We are already presenting the patient in a multidisciplinary conference, a, a tumor board where we have the pulmonologist, we have a thoracic surgeon there, we have interventional, um, we have radiologists, we have a medical oncologist and radiation oncologist. And we actually talk about the patient's case before we even do any biopsies to say, okay, well, what could this be? What's the best approach to get biopsies? And if the biopsy shows cancer, well, what are the different treatment options? We try to think through the process before we subject anyone to an invasive procedure. And so as part of that, we will say, oh, listen, this really should uh, be approached by a bronchoscopy or navigational bronchoscopy, pulmon pulmonary you take over, or you know what, this really should be a CT guided approach. Let's, let's contact interventional radiology, or maybe no one can get to it. We need the thoracic surgeon to go and do the surgery to get a sample. So all this talked about up front. And then if the cancer is confirmed, uh, we also are often talking about staging. Um, okay, so if we find cancer cells from here, what stage are we talking about? And then depending on the stage, then what's the treatment? And uh, again, all the doctors with the relevant disciplines that you see there are all in the same. We're talking about the patient before we really um, do anything invasive. Um, of course, if someone's already had a diagnosis, uh, we certainly talk about those patients as well in terms of what's best for them. But uh, this tumor board actually, I, I'm, I, uh, I feel it's fairly unique in the sense that we're talking about patients even before they have a diagnosis. So future directions, uh, these are some of my thoughts. Um, there, we can always do better. We can do better screening. We do lung cancer screening now, but again, 24% have some abnormalities, only three or 4% have lung cancer. Can we do a little bit better? So there's work on serum or breath biomarkers now to detect lung cancer. Maybe this is something we combine with CT screening to try and of those abnormalities um, that are detected on CT scan, maybe we can get a better idea of, okay, is the chance of a cancer higher or lower and be a little bit more selective in how we follow up or who we biopsy. Certainly, there are advances in biopsy techniques. Uh, I mentioned the endobronchial ultrasound. That's been an advancement in navigational bronchoscopy. We actually now at CPNC use a robotic navigational bronchoscopy where we have a robot arm that has much more precision and much more degrees of articulation to get to deep parts of the lung. Um, and now there's talk of combining that with a CT scanner in, in the procedure room, et cetera. So there's always that improvement ongoing in biopsy techniques better tests, uh, better tests to predict response to treatment and predict cancer behavior. Um, and certainly this is an area of active research and then uh, absolutely better treatments. And I think really uh, where the field is heading are uh, newer and newer treatments, uh, looking at the biology that's unique to tumors. So no longer relying on chemotherapy where we're just saying cancer cells go faster and that's what we're targeting uh, to really uh, be able to have treatments that hone in on just the cancer cells um, due to some unique feature of those cancer cells and really to spare the rest of your normal cells. And so just uh, to highlight what we do at CPMC, uh, our thoracic oncology program, everything I talked about here, technologies, expertise, everything uh, we do here. So I'm not talking about things that aren't available at CPMC. Um, and we really do have a multidisciplinary approach to lung non-joint lung cancer evaluation and treatment. I mentioned that weekly diagnostic thoracic tumor board meeting with the pulmonologist, radiologist, thoracic surgeons, medical oncologists, and radiation oncologists all 
all together at the same time, talking about patients uh, with lung nodules and lung cancer. And then just uh, to give you a sense of the workflow and why it is scary and, and often confusing and, and therefore really um, we want you to reach out and ask for help is let's say someone comes in with a lung nodule or mass, whether it's detected or uh, by CT done for another reason, or maybe it's a lung cancer screening detected abnormality. Uh, really um, at our CPNC thoracic oncology program starts off with an evaluation by the pulmonary physician who then would present the case at this diagnostic thoracic tumor board. All the disciplines are there, decide how should we biopsy it? What's the best way? Is it the bronchoscopy, EBUS, navigational bronchoscopy? If that's the case, then pulmonary takes the lead. Is it by CT guided a biopsy where interventional radiology then becomes involved or is it by surgery because we can't get to any, any other way and that's where the thoracic surgeon who's at the tumor board uh, takes the lead. And then once the diagnosis is made, what is the diagnosis? What kind of cancer? What's the stage? What are the treatment options? Uh, that's where the referrals then are sent to radiation oncology, medication, medical oncology, maybe both. Uh, thoracic surgery is also part of that. And so uh, really things are pre-planned um, and done in an expedited manner because everyone is uh, together at the same time. Um, so with that, I will stop for any questions. Well, I know that Deb has been busy answering some of these questions in the chat, but in a moment after we answer your portion of the questions, we'll pass it on over to Deb so that she could share her information. Some of them will just be information you've already touched on, but we'll also read out the answers that Deb typed out um, just for participants who are dialing in and they don't have access to a screen so they can hear our answers. Um, all right, so one of the first questions asks, can lung cancer um, be so slow growing that it is better not to treat it if you are in your 70s or 80s? Uh, yes, there is a certain type of lung cancer called adenocarcinoma in situ. Uh, that's the new name. It used to be called bronchoalveolar carcinoma. And that one tends to have a, a, a certain type of appearance on CT scan called a ground glass opacity. And that type of cancer tends to grow very slowly and not to spread. And so there are certainly patients that we see that, we've identified it, we've even biopsied it, and we choose not to do anything about it because maybe because of advanced age and knowing that the cancer is something that's slow growing, it's not something that's going to cause problems ever, and we, we leave it alone. But that is a that is an active clinical decision. It's not a, oh, I don't know what it is, but your advanced age, so we're not going to do anything about it. That's an active decision where we know what it is. <clears throat> because we know what it is, we can then say, okay, well, this is the behavior of it, and therefore you can decide whether you want to do anything about it. A true informed decision not to do anything about it rather than a just because you are advanced age, we're just not going to do anything about it. But yes, there are certain situations like that. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, I think this next question refers to what I also read in a, UC, in a UCSF article about the high rate of Asian females who are non-smokers but have lung cancer. Can you speak to that? Yeah, so it's an area of active research, and actually it was first noticed when the first targeted therapies came out. Um, and the first one was uh, a epidermal growth factor receptor, a EGFR receptor. And it was noted that there was an increased proportion of patients who had um, these mutations who were non-smoking females. The exact reason why that is, um, is still uncertain and it's still undergoing a lot of research. I don't think anyone has actually pinpointed the exact mechanism and maybe it's not one mechanism, but um, it definitely is a observation that has been borne out over time and that um, really um, came to the forefront with these targeted therapies because these were the patients that tended to respond better to them that had certain mutations. Thank you, that was very interesting. Um, this next question is related to smoking and we have a, a couple of questions related to smoking. The first is, 
does e-cigarette smoking, such as vaping, have the same risk of having of um, putting you at of having lung cancer with versus regular smoking? Yeah, the the truthful answer is don't know. Uh, e-cigarettes are relatively new. Uh, the uh, if you looked at how much smoking and for how long it takes to increase that risk of lung cancer for the high risk population. Remember, we're talking about pack year history. So we were talking about people who smoke for 20 or 30 years of pack a day for us to consider them to be a high risk for lung cancer. And e-cigarettes just haven't been around for that long. And so is it possible that in 20 or 30 years, in a certain segment of patients who have used a lot of e-cigarettes, we will see an increase in lung cancer. It's possible. We just don't have that duration of time yet. As a pulmonologist, though, I know that uh, there are other lung diseases um, that are associated with smoking that can also occur in non-smokers uh, through inhalation of smoke. So we think of any burning of material and Breathing in that smoke, if you're really breathing in smoke over a long period of time, that's probably, it can increase your risk of lung disease for sure, uh, such as emphysema or COPD, but it probably does increase the risk of lung cancer. And the best example that I can give you is there's a lung condition that's associated with smoking. It's not cancer. It's called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. Um, and and, and another term for it would be emphysema. And we know that worldwide, um, in, in countries that burn a lot of biomass fuels, so uh, wood for cooking or coal or things like that, um, patients who are non-smokers who breathe in a lot of that smoke, they develop COPD. And, and they do have a higher incidence of lung cancer as well. And so as a pulmonologist, I counsel my patients when they ask about smoke inhalation Long-term, frequent inhalation of any type of smoke probably does increase your risk of cancer. It's just a little bit easier to quantify with cigarette smoking because you can say, well, how many cigarettes do you smoke a day? How long do you smoke? And it gives us a way to quantify how much inhalation of the smoke is. Uh, but, um, but at its basic sort of um, mechanism level, uh, there probably is a risk if you have a long enough exposure uh, and a high enough exposure. So I counsel my patients to avoid, uh, if, if they really want to decrease risk, and avoid frequent exposure to any burn product. I think that that at least partially or entirely answers our next question, uh, which is, is it the smoke itself? or what is in the smoke that is likely to put you at risk for lung cancer. And I think that you mentioned COPD being one of the risks that can develop, but what about lung cancer and perhaps any other diseases that you can um, speak to? Yeah, the problem with smoking and home burning is there's so many things that are in the smoke in terms of compounds and so many particles. And there is ongoing research to determine, well, what is it? Is it the particles that are of 2.5 parts per million, five, et cetera, is a chemical. So I don't think it's any one thing that's been teased out. Um, so I, I, I and, and not all smoke is the same. I, I grant you that. Um, but um, I, I think that uh, there isn't any one substance in smoke uh, that is that we're going to say, okay, it's this substance that causes lung cancer. Um, but in general, any burning for an extended period of time is is potentially going to increase risk of lung disease and, and possibly of lung cancer. It's very, thank you. A uh, very thorough answer to the smoke, smoking question. Uh, we have an audience member, Ernest, uh, who mentioned that he he'd quit smoking 19 years ago after 30 plus years of smoking. Uh, and they're not eligible for a low dose CT, but he is 74 without any lung problems. Any suggestions for future screenings that he can seek out? Yeah, so we get this question a lot and it comes down to informed consent. And so uh, the, the, the short answer is we don't know if screening is gonna benefit you, Ernest, because that's not what the 
clinical trials were designed for. They were designed for a high risk population. Uh, so they chose patients who by any means would be considered heavy smokers because they have the highest risk of cancer. Now you have to understand when these studies are done, the people who do the studies, they really want to stack the deck in terms of finding a good out, a, a positive outcome. They want a positive study. They want to find a difference. And so they're going to choose the extremes of population, the real high risk uh, to, to really study because that gives them the best chance of showing the benefit. Uh, if you're at a little bit lower risk, would you benefit from screening? Uh, the question is we don't know right now because no study has been done in the lower risk population. Um, and so it becomes a discussion of informed consent of, okay, we don't know for you, but we know for a higher risk patient, lung cancer screening does work. If you are really interested and you fall out of the guidelines, we can talk about, well, what does that mean in terms of uh, if we find something, we might have to pursue it. So you might get more CT scans and it turns out to be nothing uh, significant. Or maybe even we find something, we're worried, we do a biopsy, and it turns out not to be cancer, and you underwent an unnecessary biopsy. So those are all considerations that um, that we would have a discussion about. Uh, but certain patients, even after that discussion, uh, will say, you know, I understand the risks and benefits, but for whatever reason, I still want to pursue lung cancer screening. And so, sure, have we done lung cancer screening CT scans out of the exact guidelines for unique reasons after important discussion we have. Um, but it takes a discussion, it takes informed decision making. And because it is outside of the guidelines, um, the insurance companies won't pay for it. And so there's an understanding that it's going to be a self pay as well. Now, most of the radiology centers, including CPMC, understand that some patients may still be interested. And so uh, they do have a, um, a, a sort of a, a a self-pay cost that's very reasonable for a lung cancer screen. But you actually would need to have a discussion with a physician knowing that you are out of the guidelines, but that is the true informed consent and you understand uh, the, the risks with it. Thank you, Dr. Warren. That was the last question we have. Uh, I'd like to make time now to call back Deb to the stage where she can expand on the low-dose CT scan information and, um, and also for me to read over some of the questions that she helped answer typed questions or typed answers for so that we can make sure we capture it onto today's recording and participants who couldn't make it to the live presentation could view it later on. Deb, how's it going? Hi, Twin. It's going good. And I'm glad that you're doing that while Dr. Horn's still on because I typed up these questions while he was speaking so he can confirm my answers or add to them. Um, that would be most appreciated. So which would you prefer for me to read the questions and the answers or? Why don't I read you the questions just like I did with Dr. Horn and then he can let us know if you really did your research. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, so one of the questions you helped us answer is, would having a close relative who died from non-small cell lung cancer be eligible for lung cancer screening? So because of the specific criteria that Dr. Horn mentioned with for CMS, Medicare, just having a relative does not make you um, eligible for the test itself. You have to have that be within the age 50 to 77, 20 pack year history, current smoker quit within the last 15 years, and no signs and symptoms of lung cancer. Um, as Dr. Horn mentioned, if you have a conversation with your doctor, sometimes there are other ways that they can go ahead and order these exams. Um, we, I frequently will have patients that don't meet the criteria, and I will send a letter to their doctor and ask them to try to get a pre authorization from insurance. And sometimes they're successful at that and sometimes they're not. Um, CPMC does offer a private pay. And last I checked, and please don't hold me to this, the estimate is that it's about $310 if a patient chooses to pay out of pocket. Thank you. <clears throat> and sorry, did you want it to yeah, add no, anything? That sounds about right. And I was going to say, that's actually deflationary. I, I believe it started off at 400 <laughs> It's actually deflationary, which is great. Good. 
I'm glad that some things are going down. <laughs> um, so if, if someone is not a smoker, do they need to worry about lung cancer? And Dr. Uh, Horan, I know that you answered this already, but Deb, why don't you share what you wrote out here? Oh, I just said it depends on your risk factors. Secondhand smoke, environmental exposures, and family history are things that can raise the risk for you, but smoking is still the number one cause. Yeah, and talking about risk factors, are the effects of wildfire smoke going to increase your risk of lung cancer? So what I responded in there is that wildfire smoke and smoke from structures like a house fire all contain carcinogenic pollutants. So the longer you're exposed to it, the longer you're breathing it in, then it increases your risk. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But as Dr. Horn mentioned, there's not, um, I don't know that there's a whole lot of studies that have been done yet because of quantifying how much smoke you're, you've got as an intake. I'm, I'm really uh, there are, And uh, let me just add, um, within our formal practice, there are certain occupations or even if a patient's a non-smoker, we will consider them to be a higher risk. And the ones that I can think of are firefights. Right? So it's not just we have wildfire season, it's smoky in the air for a day or two and we're breathing it in. But if you're a firefighter and you're out there in the front line and you're fighting fires and breathing in the smoke all the time, um, yes, I think that degree of smoke exposure uh, is something that we pay attention to. Whereas I think for the general public, with wildfire season, a couple of days where it tends to um, have higher particulate matter, uh, I don't think lung cancer should really be a big concern uh, for you. Um, there are other concerns if you have underlying lung disease that may be triggered or worsen if you're asthmatic, COPD, where during the time that there's higher smoke or higher particulate matter in the air, that can trigger your underlying lung disease, but the overall risk of lung cancer from just a couple of days of smoky areas is probably very minimal. I have also wondered this, especially when uh, the whole Bay Area turned red, if you remember, <laughs> oh, and daytime never actually came and it just always looked dark. That was a very scary time. Uh, this next question asks about the number of CT scans one can get. Deb, can you speak to um, whether a person should get two TC scans or more if they don't experience any symptoms? What I would say is lung cancer screening is done annually, once a year. Um, does it lead to additional CTs? Sometimes it can. Uh, I'll leave it to Dr. Horn to answer, but I would say personally, every time you can reduce the amount of radiation you have, the better. Um, so I'm not sure. I almost asked the, this person to clarify this answer as to, um, or the question, what would be the reason to get two CT scans? Would I think I would need to know that as before I could really say whether or not they should have that. <laughs> Yeah. Dr. Horn? Yeah, let me add on to that. So um, if you, if everything looks fine, meaning there's no abnormalities, the lungs look normal, you should get one CT scan in here. Uh, if you have some abnormalities, depending on what the abnormalities look like, there's actually very well uh, structured follow-up time frame uh, based on what is seen. And that was part of the research protocol in terms of following it up. Uh, it, you'll hear a term called lung RADS. That's really the categorization system of what is abnormal. And depending on how abnormal or how concerning the abnormality is for lung cancer, then there's guidelines or recommendations of, okay, maybe some of them that are real concerning, we might repeat a CT in three months, or we might say, you know what, this really looks like lung cancer, let's go for biopsy. Some findings are so non-concerning, so small that we say, yeah, you know, the same schedule of one year follow up that we would do anyways is, is good enough. And then there's gradations between three, six months, six months, et cetera. So if you have no abnormalities, it's a normal looking CT, no benefit to doing it any more frequently. And in fact, the European study, the Nelson trial, they did a CT every two years. Okay, that was part of their protocol. They still found a mortality benefit. Uh, but, um, but for the data that we have, it's once a year. If there are abnormalities, 
what's the abnormality because then there's a whole set of uh, guidelines or protocols on how often to follow. And just to follow up with, with that, as I look at that question a little bit more, um, should a person have more than two CT scans if they're not experiencing symptoms? If you have your low-dose screening and it does come back and the recommendation by the tumor board is to follow up in three months or six months with another CAT scan, I would leave it to the professionals and take their recommendation because we know that people have lung cancer and don't get it diagnosed till really late stage because they are asymptomatic. That's the benefit of this low-dose CT is finding it before you come, become symptomatic. So I wouldn't let your symptoms, whether or not you're having symptoms, cloud your judgment as to what the professionals recommend. Thank you. And this last question and will also go to people who might want to raise their hand to be unmuted. Uh, but this last question in the Q&A is for all of the family members who want to encourage other family members. Uh, what are good ways to approach the conversation with family members so that they can feel encouraged to get screened? So I responded that I think the best message is that if lung cancer is caught early, there are more treatment options and a longer survivability um, when it's treated at the early stage. So Dr. Horn, do you have more to add? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, what I tell patients, and I'm a little bit more blunt, is if we can catch lung cancer early, we have a chance to cure you. If we catch it late, we can't cure you. We can just control it. And so uh, if you have the appropriate risk factors, you're asymptomatic, we want to keep you that way. We want to be able to catch lung cancer early and cure you of the lung cancer. So I'm going to piggyback onto that. And I know that this wasn't part of that question, but um, the one of the big things to talk to family members about is smoking cessation and the importance of stopping smoking. Um, or at least decreasing the amount that they smoke. Uh, and that's a real difficult conversation to have with loved ones. Um, it's a true addiction. They've said that it can be harder to stop than using heroin. Um, what I've found in talking to many, many people is it's that hand-to-mouth habit that is so hard to break. Um, but there are really good resources out there. There are now medications that can help with the withdrawal and the cravings, Chantex and Zyban. Um, of course, there's the patches and the gums and things like that. Um, and then there's a program called Kick It California, K-I-C-K-I-T California. You can Google that. They have an app that you can put on your phone. Um, they have a lot of different um programs that you can be a part of and you can chat live time. I think the most important thing is that a lot of the counselors that are involved in the lifetime chat are former smokers themselves, so they get it. So um, yes, we want we want family members to get screened, but we also want you to support your loved one in trying to get them to quit smoking and if they can, at least get them to reduce the amount that they smoke. Thank you for that. I'd like to open the floor and make sure everybody who has more questions get a chance to hear answers to those. Uh, if you'd like, please raise your hand and tell us what's on your mind. Um, the raise hand button is, I know that we can't see you, but we can see you if you raise your hand by pressing the button at the bottom of your screen. Um, Twin, there is one more question that came up. Um, do wood burning fireplaces increase lung cancer risk? Uh, depends on how much you inhale. In. <laughs> so yes, if you're wood burning every day um, and breathing in that smoke, um, you can, um, over time, many, many years, have an increased risk of COPD and lung cancer. Um, now, going to a campfire here and there, that's probably not going to do it. Uh, and, and the data I have to support it, um, you always want to ask, well, how do you know, is um, that we see an increased incidence of COPD and lung cancer in developing countries where uh, wood stoves are used uh, to burn uh, for cooking. And so we see uh, patients, females, males, but people who are cooking all the time using uh, wood um, as the main fuel source um, 
cell uh, lung disease later on. Thank you. Does anybody out there have a question they'd like to raise their hand and be unmuted for? I know that there was a hand earlier, but we didn't get to the question and the participant. We might have already addressed their question, um, but I can make sure I provide information on um, the resources that, oh, okay. I see that Rose in the audience has raised her hand. Rose, why don't you let us know what's on your mind? It shows that she's muted, Twin. There she goes. Yeah. Okay. You can hear me now? We can. Um, okay, great. Um, I have um, been hearing more about plastics in the environment. And some of it is um, nanoplastics that are in the air, I believe, I've heard. So I wonder if the either of your professionals have um, heard of any any data, um, lung problems as a result of that? Uh, yeah, great question. Uh, I think microplastics are becoming a bigger and bigger problem that we're recognizing more. Nothing specific linking it to lung cancer that I've seen yet. Um, but it also may be a duration thing. Um, as, as, you'll, as you'll remember, uh, lung cancer typically develops many years after the smoke exposure. Um, decades even. And so we oftentimes see a lag in the lung cancer rates by about 20 or 30 years from the smoking rate. So when you see smoking go up, then 20 or 30 years later, lung cancer rates go up. And it turns out that because smoking uh, rates have gone down um, starting about 30 years ago, we're seeing actually our lung cancer incidence rates uh, going down a little bit as well. So don't know who would be the bottom line for that. <laughs> Time will tell. <laughs> we will see. Thank you for your question, Rose. I see that we have another person in the audience. Uh, Columba, let me, I think that you might be, there we are. You can go ahead and unmute yourself now. Uh, collection between emphysema and lung cancer. Yes, strong connection. Both are smoking. Because I have emphysema, <clears throat> and uh, I also been diagnosed with that the glass thing, the can. The is, brown is glass. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. But it was uh, didn't grow from 2017 to now. So I am in the middle of the tests and stuff. So great question. The same risk factors that uh -huh. lead to emphysema yeah. also lead to lung cancer. And that's okay. primarily smoking. Wonderful. Uh, so yes. So I, have, uh, yeah, I smoked for 20, 30 years. I quit 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, 2017, they saw this little thing that looked like a... Yeah. Yeah. So that is really, if that is lung cancer, that would be a relatively unique type of lung cancer, most likely that adenocarcinoma in situ, which tends to grow very slowly. And that's why for those type of ground glass nodules, we don't uh -huh. follow for just a, a two year period, which is our standard. We tend to follow those for longer. So uh, I've been uh, seeing a doctor there in your system. There was a CT scan every six months. So the thing has not grown too much. And that's the, what is, what I'm um, going for. Okay. I don't know about your specific circumstances, but yes, that that there is definitely the same risk factors for emphysema are also in play for lung cancer. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was very, very uh, a, a wonderful presentation. I'm very pleased I attended. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. um, 
The floor is still open for anybody with questions. Please feel free to either type those questions or raise your hand. I, I will go ahead and get started with our closing. There's not much, but I wanted to um, make sure everyone get this look or look out for a post event email that I will be sending out. I will ask, I will connect with Deb to get links of some of the websites that she mentioned. And I will make sure that um, everybody everybody gets those gets those links along with the feedback form for today's presentation, so you can share your thoughts. Wonderful. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. All right. If uh, there are no more questions in the audience, I think that we can end five minutes early. Thank you so much, Dr. Horn and Dr. Er Deb. <laughs> I think that um, your name on my screen always makes me think of DR. And I... <laughs> doctor. Um, but thank you so much for joining us, Deb, and answering some of these questions with me. Not with me, but with Dr. Horn. I was really excited to have posted you both. And I'm just grateful that we have all of these great questions. We are very grateful to you and all the work that you did to put this program together for us. Um, so thank you very much. You did a fantastic job. And it's been a pleasure to work with you. And thank you it's for the great. invitation and the opportunity to speak. We'd loved having you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.